Right, welcome, welcome back to the second lecture of today entitled The Need and the Desire to Go and Arrive. And I would like to add and to remain. My name's Massimo Renelli and I'm responsible for migration within our organization and I'll be the facilitator of this round. And I'm glad to talk about the connection between migration seen as a collective challenge to the capitalist world or order of the world and the fight of people for their rights with wonderful guests like Sandra, Sandro Metzadra and Musa Changari. Sandra will open and I'll introduce them in a moment and then in the forum Capitalist Globalization and Border, border Transition Massimo, uh, sorry, uh, Musa will join us and discuss. We agreed that everybody should use their own language or the language of their choice. Sandra will speak English, Changeri will speak French, and I'll speak German as the facilitator. As we have simultaneous translation in four languages, this can be done. Let me point out one thing to all those who have just joined us. Julia Manik will tell us a bit more about housekeeping. Uh, Jasmin and myself, vielleicht erst auf Deutsch. Uh, hello from backstage, Raum von... Hello from backstage. This is Jasmin and myself speaking. There is simultaneous translation and you have to click on the globe button at the bottom of your screen. If you shouldn't see it, then you should dial in using the Zoom app and you will see it. Myself, there is a translation available for you, which can be found by clicking on the globe, globe icon you can see on the bottom of your screen. If you don't see this icon, please use the Zoom application and reconnect. Y hola desde el backstage de la parte de Yasmine de mí. Hay una función de traducción para ustedes. Puede seleccionarse por medio del icono del, del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Si no encuentran este icono, les pedimos el favor de reconectarse a través de la aplicación de Zoom. Y bonjour depuis les coulisses de la part de Jasmine et de et moi. Il y a une fonction de traducción pour vous qui peut être seleccionée par l'icône du globe terrestre en bas de l'écran. Et si vous ne trouvez pas cette icône, reconnectez-vous à la session en utilisant l'application de Zoom. Un peu plus tard. Thank you very much, Julia. Let's turn to Sandra now. I'm very happy to introduce him. Benvenuto to Sandra. Sandra Mitzadra is living and working at Bologna. He's a professor of political theory and he's a research fellow at the Institute for Culture and Society at the Western University in Sydney, Australia. Before this, he was a research fellow at the New School in New York and in Berlin and at Ljubljana University and in Ecuador and in Buenos Aires. Recently, he has worked mainly on the relationship between globalization, migration and political struggle in present capitalism and post-colonial theory and its interventions. He's also one of the founders of an activist Italian website. He's written many books and edited many. I'd like to name a few. Un mondo di guadagnare, the world to win, and the multiplication of labor, and as a third, the politics of operations excavating contemporary capitalism, published in 2019. At the moment, apart from many international scientific projects, he's coordinating uh, several projects, and now. I'm looking forward to his presentation until one o'clock, the need and the desire to go and to arrive on the world situation of post-colonial post capitalism. Go ahead, Sandra. Allow me to start by warmly thanking uh, the organizers uh, of this uh, timely conference uh, and among them, in particular, my dear friend, Thomas Zybert, for inviting me to give a lecture on such a challenging 
and uh, indeed also a bit intimidating topic uh, as uh, the world situation of post-colonial uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. To engage uh, in a discussion of the world from the angle of the possibilities of uh, its reconstruction is indeed a crucial task in the current uh, conjuncture, or uh, as we can say with uh, a classical reference uh, in this uh, distracted uh, globe. I will try to contribute to this uh, necessarily collective endeavor with uh, an analysis uh, of some of the main trends uh, that uh, it seems to me shape the development of capitalism uh, in the framework of uh, the pandemic uh, crisis. We have to be aware of the fact uh, that capitalism uh, is uh, characterized by a kind uh, of uh, elective uh, affinity with crisis, uh, which uh, often uh, provided the opportunity for a dramatic uh, and even uh, radical uh, reorganization of uh, its working. A methodic principle must be clarified at the very beginning of uh, this lecture. The analysis of the current state of uh, capitalism is not a task to be accomplished uh, independently from a search for uh, the potentialities for transformation and even uh, liberation. Let me exemplify this point. Haiti and Moria are taken in this conference as uh, iconic uh, representations of the misery of uh, our world, and rightly so. They both instantiate the violent dispossession and brutality that crisscross the history of capitalism writ large, and in particular, its colonial and imperial variants. And that seems even more widespread and globalized today. Necropolitics and exclusion seem to fully grasp what is going on here. But while such notions are doubtlessly helpful, we should also look for different angles when confronted with situations like Haiti and Moria. We should, for instance, carefully trace the persistent imprint and mutations of social movements and struggles since the Asian Revolution in the 1790s in order to shed light on even unexpected possibilities of subaltern resistance and power. And we should link the catastrophe of Moria to wider geographies of movements and struggles of migration across borders to give a sense of the political stakes that surround even an abject site like the infamous camp on the Greek island of Lesbos. And this I want to repeat without ever losing sight of the outrageous reality of violence, exclusion, and dispossession that proliferate at the very heart of post-colonial capitalism. So the notion of post-colonial capitalism, which uh, figures uh, in the title of my lecture as widely circulated in critical debates over the last years. For many scholars, for instance, for uh, the Bengali economist Kalyan Sanyal, it mainly refers uh, to the form taken by capitalist development in the former colonized world. Contending that what Marx famously analyzed in terms of uh, the so-called primitive uh, accumulation at the same time constantly repeats itself 
and never ends up in processes of full-fledged proletarianization, Sanyal stresses the importance and new nature of poverty and the politics of poverty, in particular in India. I have learned from such debates in India and elsewhere, for instance, uh, in Latin America. But my use of post-colonial capitalism uh, is uh, a bit different. Mm. To put it quickly, I take that notion as a critical lens on the one, uh, as a critical lens that allows me to investigate the global dimension of contemporary capitalism looking on the one hand at the reproduction in scattered form of the legacy of colonialism, and on the other hand, at the emergence of new assemblages of uh, space and capital that work the boundary between center and periphery. And far from limiting uh, post-colonial uh, capitalism to the former colonized world, I insist on the fact that also the former metropolis become post-colonial, which becomes particularly apparent when we look at movements of migration, but also more generally at the transformations of labor and citizenship. Let me be clear on this point. Post-colonial capitalism is not the only notion I use to define contemporary capitalism. In my work, and particularly in my collaborative uh, writing with uh, Brett Nielsen, I rather uh, take it uh, as a critical framework uh, to be combined with others from uh, racial capitalism to patriarchal capitalism, from financial to logistical capitalism. And I am indeed convinced that only such an interplay between different critical gazes can produce an adequate understanding of the shifting forms of exploitation, dispossession, and domination that make up contemporary capitalism as well as of the heterogeneous subjective composition struggling within and against those forms of exploitation, dispossession, and domination. Key to my work is uh, the idea that contemporary capitalism is characterized by a high homogeneity of capital's operations. The prominence of finance and logistics is emblematic in this respect. But the very way in which such operations are deployed, hit the ground, prompts differential regimes of labor and accumulation. Think of food delivery platforms to give just one Example, the smooth working of the algorithm is structurally combined here with a deep diversification of the workforce. Difference, quote and unquote, is therefore more and more important for the critique of contemporary capitalism, which explains why gender and race cannot be considered as a secondary or external element or contradictions. So there was a need uh, to say something uh, on the notion of uh, post-colonial capitalism as well as uh, on the way in which uh, I use it in my critical uh, approach to contemporary capitalism. But let me now come more directly to the issue of capitalism and uh, the pandemic crisis. I was uh, saying before that uh, I am convinced that uh, the global dimension is constitutive of contemporary capitalism. No capitalism without a global dimension. When I speak of uh, a global dimension, I'm not rehearsing uh, 
the fantasies of a smooth global space, of a borderless world brought about by market freedom and liberal democracy that characterized the discussion of globalization in the 1990s. Between Seattle and Genoa, those fantasies were disposed of even before history took a different turn at the beginning of the new century. Global dimension rather uh, refers for me to a set of crucial global processes uh, that selectively connect and disconnect a fractured global space, uh, enabling different forms uh, of mobility, mobility of staff and capitals, no less than humans, uh, upon which the valorization and accumulation of capital in their current forms are predicated. What I have in mind, speaking of a global dimension, are, for instance, global supply chains, logistical corridors, financial circuits, maritime routes, pipelines, data centers, submarine cables, corridors for the recruitment of migrant uh, labor. Hmm? So if one uh, emphasizes uh, this connection between uh, contemporary capitalism, global processes, and mobility that was only rhetorically challenged, even by Donald Trump and the likes, it is easy to see that the outbreak of the pandemic raised substantial problems. Hmm? In a particularly pronounced way, in the first months, the pandemic crisis was indeed a crisis of mobility. Needless to say, migrants and refugees paid the highest price for this crisis of mobility. But even for capital, it was a shock which took in particular the form of a, a slowing down and even still stand of the logistical apparatus. Looking at logistics uh, and more generally at uh, the mobility business uh, provides us with uh, a privileged angle on the transformations of capitalism in the framework of the current uh, crisis. And we have uh, to admit that logistics was able to reorganize its circuits and its working quite quickly. In many parts of the world, logistics was classified by governments as an essential economic activity during the pandemic, with the ensuing classification of logistical workers as, quote and unquote, essential workers. I will pick up again on this definition in a while. For now, let me stress that uh, speaking of uh, logistics uh, implies speaking of a very wide and heterogeneous domain of uh, economic activity, including, for instance, the warehouses of Amazon and container ships, port docks, and uh, last mile delivery. One thing uh, is uh, sure, capital invested in logistics is doomed to exponentially grow in the next years. And the logistical rationality will spread even further across uh, economies and uh, societies. In many ways, an instantiation of uh, the logistical rationality, digital platforms will also definitely figure among the winners of the current uh, crisis. One can say that the name uh, Jeff Bezos uh, effectively instantiates the combination of logistics uh, and platforms. In general, platforms have entrenched their grip on social relations during uh, 
the pandemic, uh, precisely managing the crisis of mobility that uh, I was mentioning before. This is clear for food delivery platforms like Deliveroo and uh, Just Eat. But think also of such platforms as Zoom and Teams, which helped us to manage a crisis of sociability while also enabling smart working, as they call it, and a wide range of crucial social activities, from education to political activism at a distance. Mm -hmm. The stock market value of such platforms increased in a spectacular way, with, for instance, Zoom's capitalization exceeding General Motors last May. And let me add that over the last year, what we can call the financialization of platforms has reached an unprecedented stage, as, for instance, the stock exchange listing of Airbnb last December amply demonstrates. <laughs> Indeed, if one considers the core business of Airbnb, which has to do with a specific form of mobility jeopardized and even disrupted by the crisis, it may result at first difficult to understand the reason of its stock exchange. Amazing success. Such a success has definitely to do with the very form of the platform, with a new business form that is deeply transforming entrepreneurship and labor well beyond the domain of digital platforms in the narrow sense. And let us focus on labor, which is what matters for me. Scholars engaged in the study of digital platforms used to distinguish between platform labor and what they call platformization of labor. So the first notion refers to work directly managed and commanded by digital platforms, while the second attempts to grasp the disruptive effects of the operations of platforms for the organization of labor and production in established branches of industry and services. I would I need much more time to expand on such effects, which work the boundary between labor and life. Suffice it to say that the prevailing form of organization of platform labor combines algorithmic management with the reemergence of supposedly outdated and even quote unquote archaic forms of work, like, for instance, piecework. Labor rights and social benefits are effectively erased here, as well as any idea of uh, a standard employment uh, relation. And uh, what the platformization of labor ideally foreshadows is a dystopic 24-7 mobilization of labor and life that prompts the valorization and accumulation of capital as uncontested societal norm. Again, there would be, of course, much more to say on, that, on digital platforms as well as on the tensions and conflicts uh, that surround them. Mm. I just focused on some of the tendencies that prompt their uh, development in a time of pandemic uh, crisis. Let me add that, picking up again on the question of the global, the spread of digital platforms and platform labor is far from being limited to the West. It is rather a global process that takes different forms in different parts of the world. Critical scholars and activists working on platforms largely speak the same language because they are confronted with the same kind of processes and problems. And last October, there was a first global day of action promoted by grassroots rider unions from Latin America and Europe. 
Nevertheless, the post-colonial nature of contemporary capitalism emerges also here. And more generally, with respect to digital labor, the geographies of uh, what Antonio Casilli, for instance, calls um, the information sweatshops where workers execute in unending working days the most repetitive, physically stressing and alienating tasks to enable the working of, of artificial intelligence and digital platforms largely coincide with former colonial geographies. Needless to say, the role of China should be analyzed here. And there is uh, a need to stress uh, that the shift toward China of the global balance of economic power, uh, accelerated by the pandemic, is more generally a fundamental element to take into account when we speak of the future of capitalism. The current geopolitical competition on the vaccines is, uh, of course, uh, deeply related uh, to that. Mm. However, mm. I cannot uh, dwell on such uh, questions uh, now for uh, want of time. Focusing on uh, logistics, finance, and digital platforms, I attempted to sketch what I consider some of the main trends in the working and nature of capitalism emerging out of the current uh, crisis. But let me add that, uh, however important in themselves for the wider effects they deploy, logistics, finance, and digital platforms are far from constituting uh, capital as a whole. Looking uh, in particular at uh, labor and life of the poor, the subaltern, the dispossessed, and the exploited, we must uh, necessarily widen our uh, analytical uh, perspective. What is really crucial from this point of view mm. is social reproduction, often predicated upon unpaid labor mm. performed by women. We must closely look from this point of view at a societal fabric that has been severely tested by the pandemic and by the ensuing economic disruption. We must critically analyze the spread of fear and individualism while emphasizing at the same time that in many parts of the world we have witnessed amazing practices of solidarity, mutualism, and self-organization. But we also have to take stock of the fact that the pandemic has further accelerated and entrenched a trend to the explosive growth of inequality and polarization of wealth that builds a structural feature of contemporary capitalism. The inequality virus, the report released by Oxfam a couple of weeks ago, describes uh, such growth uh, of uh, inequality at the global level in the last year in telling and appalling uh, ways. When we read that the increase of wealth of the 10 richest billionaires since the crisis began is more than enough to pay for a COVID-19 vaccine for all, well, any measure really seems to be lost. But the Oxfam report also demonstrates that poverty is more and more racialized and sexualized, while uh, informal workers, uh, and among them platform workers, uh, are uh, on the front line. Add to this uh, the multiplication of uh, environmental uh, imbalances and even catastrophes that played uh, a key role in spurring the pandemic, as we know, and you get a clear 
although dark picture of the predicament of life under contemporary capitalism. Let us be clear, the emerging trends in logistics, finance, and digital platforms that I have outlined will not contribute to positively transform such a dire condition. Combined with other trends, they rather foreshadow a new terrain of capitalist development where the relation between capital and labor skips any political and even legal mediation, including the one performed by the contract, by the legal device of the contract. And I'm taking labor here in a wide sense, bordering on life and including social reproduction as feminist theories and struggles taught us to do. I know. I am kind of uh, overemphasizing this point. There will be labor rights and contracts in the next future with a variable geometry of uh, and uh, geography. But my point is that uh, such rights and contracts will not define anymore the norm, the standard in labor relations unless labor movements and struggles will be able to invent and impose new rights, new norms, and even new standards. Anyway, we are confronted here with a pivotal, with a pivotal shift, with a transition to an absolute uh, capitalism, to borrow a notion from Etienne Baribar, that was prepared by the long history of uh, neoliberal hegemon, but is accomplished today in uh, unprecedented uh, forms. Hmm. The implications are potentially momentous. Hmm. Take, for instance, migration, hmm, which is not going to stop in the wake of the pandemic, but will definitely take uh, new forms in a world where the hygienic sanit sanitary reinforcement of international borders uh, has run uh, parallel to a multiplication of uh, internal boundaries of all sorts uh, during the pandemic. The kind of forced mobility, mm, this is for me an important uh, notion, the kind of forced mobility experienced by many migrants uh, during the crisis, in particular as uh, quote and unquote, essential workers in logistical warehouses, in agriculture, and as riders for food delivery platforms, may foreshadow a dystopic form of, uh, quote and unquote again, migration management, uh, according to a delivery rationality, with ghettos and even places like Moria serving as uh, recruitment uh, reservoirs. <laughs> The reconstruction of the world becomes indeed an urgent task in such a condition. Struggles and movements during the pandemic crisis provide us with an essential source of inspiration while thinking about such a reconstruction. From the movement for black lives in the US to the continuity of feminist mobilizations in Latin America and elsewhere, to mention just two important instances, a radical refusal of specific forms of violence and domination mobilizes millions of people 
to this one should add environmental campaigns, resistance against infrastructural and extractive mega projects, struggles around health and education, the stubbornness of migrants challenging increasingly fortified borders, self-organization of riders and other often migrant logistical workers in many parts of the world, including Europe. The list could easily go on. But these scattered and far from, and far from comprehensive references should be enough to demonstrate that a reconstruction of the world is in some sense already underway. And indeed, I am convinced that only movements and struggles can lay the material basis for such a reconstruction. In a way, we are talking, we are again talking about revolution, as Thomas Seibert suggests in the newspaper produced for the conference. But we are just starting to do that. We know that a radical break is needed, but we do not know how a revolution could look like today under the conditions of contemporary capitalism and in a world covered with souls by viruses, rising inequality, extreme force, forms of violence and climate change. Old theories and experiences do not necessarily help in this regard. And the vexed alternative between reform and revolution is also behind us. What really matters is a radical transformation, is a politics of liberation predicated upon an uncompromised, an uncompromised struggle against oppression, domination, dispossession, and exploitation. The work of a collective intellect and imagination is urgently needed to flesh out constitutive principles, a program from the materiality of struggles, and to foreshadow the reconstruction of the world. But uh, such an intellect and, and imagination, as well as politics in general, cannot lie and operate outside of struggles. It is rather the intertwining of bodies and intellect, passions and rationality that characterizes the most powerful movements and struggles of our time. And it is precisely such an intertwining that shapes the composition of the heterogeneous and even fractured the social cooperation that is exploited and is therefore as the, at the basis of uh, the creation of value in contemporary capitalism. That social cooperation, which of course takes different forms in different parts of the world, is eventually the real battleground for uh, the reconstruction of the world. Investigating uh, the fault lines that crisscross that battleground, working toward the building of struggles and coalitions, instituting the necessary political mediations to consolidate the emergence of a collective transformative power is for me a good, although quite abstract way to define the main tasks of the revolutionaries today. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm. Mm.